only a small percentage of golfers manage to break 70. Today I'm going to be meeting up with PGA professional Jack Backhouse to look at five tips that can help you break 70 next time you're out on the golf course. How important is it to be able to shape the ball both ways when you're trying to break 70? Not at all important, to, to be honest. You know, the likes of DJ on tour exclusively hits cuts. Bryson, he like draws every ball. I think what's more important is that you know what's coming when you stand over the ball. Whether you draw it or fade it, I don't think it really matters, but you have to know what's about to happen. If I'm fading the ball, I know the ball's gonna start left and it's gonna curve a bit, a bit right. How much right, you can never really control, but if the ball's gonna start left every time, you can start to manage your start lines around the course. And if, the, you know, and if it's going to fade, you know, if it's going to curve right, you can start to manage that curve around the course. I think where, the, where it goes wrong for people is, I'm a natural fade with the ball, I step onto a dog leg left, and now I feel a bit of pressure to hit a draw. If I've spent the last six months hitting fades, the chances of me pulling off a draw on one shot is really small and will often lead to, you know, shots that go way offline, penalty shots, lost balls and, and whatever. So it's really important, A, to know what shot's about to come, but B, just to manage your shot around the course. And if, there's, if you're faced with a shot that isn't your shape, you don't have to do something different. Just play what you know and you, you'll, you'll get around. I think also if you have one stock shape, you're almost making the fairway lag twice as wide because if I know my ball's going to move from left to right, I can aim up that left side and I've got the whole width of the fairway to kind of move the ball in. Whereas if I'm aiming down the middle and I don't know if it's going to go right or left, suddenly it's a much smaller target and miss on each side. So yeah. actually having one stock shot can be much more like confidence inspiring off the tee thinking, well, actually I've got all this room to like move the ball across. So it makes it a lot easier to actually then hit the fairway. Yeah, definitely. Now, I am certainly don't think we're saying don't have the ability to shape it both ways, but just having that one shot that you can depend on under pressure in tournaments is, you know, just gives you the confidence to be able to step up and go and play where I think what people, I think what people do wrong is they stand there, they see the fairway or they look at the green and go, there it is and I'll just hit it where I don't think that's anything like specific enough and with the whole sort of like aim small, miss small idea, you want to be trying to imagine, you know, pick a really specific target with a really specific shape that you've practiced and that way your body will create a movement that sort of will get the ball there. Um, I think if you, if you don't have a stock shape and you're just trying to play straight, I think you sort of, you're swinging and hoping where if you're out there trying to cut it, you've sort of preset the fade into your setup, you're aiming up the left and you know exactly what's coming. And I think that's, you know, the more we know what's coming, the more we can get it around the course sort of in, in the fewest shots as possible. We know if people want to shoot low numbers, they need to make their score on the par five. So what kind of strategy should people be putting in place here? So I think if we're trying to go, make, you know, make our score on the fives, you've got to be hitting driver off the tee basically every single time. We've got to get the ball down there as far as possible because really you've got to be going at the green in two. And um, there's no doubt about it. The stats say, strokes gain data suggest that we need, you know, the closer we are to the green, the lower our score is going to be. So anytime we can smash a fairway wood or a long iron down at the green, we definitely should. Gone of the days, you know, of laying up to a number we like, that's sort of just been disproven. Um, whether you like the 120 but hate the 40, you're still going to be better at 40 than you are from 120. So, you know, playing those holes as aggressively as possible is definitely the way. I think the more you play them aggressively, the more you're going to have those little chip shots and yeah. the more you're going to get better at them anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think people f feel really uncomfortable on those short pitches because it's such a short swing, but th that's nothing that a bit of practice can't do. You know, we're trying to shoot low scores, aren't we? So we have to, we sort of have to have a well-rounded game. So if you know you can get at par fives in two, you're probably going to have a lot of 30 to 40 yard shots. So you've also got to go and like devise a strategy and work on your technique around those as well. And also, I guess it means hopefully you'll have a lot of two pop birdie opportunities, which is obviously going to be easier than feeling like you have to one put to make a birdie. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even if you're putting, even if you're not on the green and you've got the putter out, the chances of you making two from there instead of that 50, 60, 70 yarder that you think you might like is way higher, isn't it? So it's a, it really, it's a no brainer. We've got to be getting down there as far as possible, getting the putter out as early as possible and, and making those birdies if we can.
So a lot of your low scoring is generally going to come from how well you can control your wedges. So really people shouldn't just be having one stock shot with each club. If you've got a wedge in your hand after you've hit a driver, then we've got to be thinking this is a scorable opportunity. We could be making birdie here. So we really want a strategy to be able to get the ball as close as possible. So how I think we need to do that is by being re well, really good at controlling distance. Players generally are very accurate with wedges, but their misses are long and short rather than left and right. So what that tells us is people don't know what swing equals what yardage. So you've really got two options here. You've got like that clock face system where if I swing my left arm to like nine o'clock, the ball's gonna go 60 yards and then 10 o'clock will be a bit different. 11 and 12 are all slightly different. Or you've got a swing which is a bit more feel based where you're gonna sort of swing it back to roughly the same place every time and then slow down to hit it shorter and maybe accelerate to hit it harder. The best way you've got to do that is get to a, you know, get on a launch monitor, get on, you know, in a swing studio or at a driving range with a track man or whatever and spend time just hitting lots of different distances. What does a 50 feel like? What does a 60 feel like? What, what swing, what does this swing produce? and just go and tie around with it and find a system that works best for you. I guess even if someone doesn't have access to a launch monitor, even going out on a practice ground and putting alignment sticks out yeah. at different distances and hitting to different ones and just experimenting with which way works best for them. Because some people work really good with the clock face and getting the hands in certain positions. And some people are just more field players and doing it with that tempo, as you said, is going to work better for them. Yeah, uh, yeah, launch monitor I think makes it a bit easier, but you definitely can do it out on grass. Probably the best place to do it is actually out on the course. You know, go out there, zap 50 yards and think, just have it, just, you know, like you say, play around with it. Am I better off if I think swing it to my left shoulder or whatever? Or am I better off just looking at the flag and, you know, feeling the rhythm of it? You know, there's no right answer in this and people have won majors doing both ways. So you've just got to get out there and hit as many shots as possible and find out what works best for you. But you definitely need a rough idea of what produces what yardage because you, we can't be playing these shots sort of just blind. Yeah, I think loads of players even almost have little grids that they've developed, haven't they? And yeah. some people keep them in the golf bag so they know like, oh, with my 52, if I do, you know, it's a six o'clock swing, it's going this far. And yeah. over time you'll learn that, but I think to start off when you're first developing that, having it written down and having it so you can actually see it and remember that is really helpful. Yeah, yeah, no, I think on, you know, on tour, if you're watching the golf on TV, all the players, they pull out the yardage charts and probably in that booklet or whatever, they have their distances. So exactly what you say, nine is this, um, 10, 11, 12 is this, and then with each different clubs and what you end up is with like a matrix of, you almost can cover every yardage between 50 and 110 with all the different swings and all the different feels. And you've got to think that that's helping them hit the ball closer and score lower. And sometimes you even end up with overlapping distances. So yeah. you might find, well, I can hit it 50 yards with my 58, but actually today it's really windy and I want to hit it lower and I can actually do this swing with my 50 that's going to go 50 yards and that might actually be better for this condition. Definitely, you know, and, and I, but you can only find that out if you go out there and you do the practice and you spend a couple of hours hitting all these wedge shots, making a note in a notebook and, and just, you know, you've got to go figure it out yourself. So when we get to about 100 yards away, it can be really easy to suddenly get very aggressive and start firing at the pins. Is that always the best strategy for kind of lower scoring? Definitely not. We know that generally you're going to have quite a lot of variance forward and back and left and right. And certainly in tournaments, you're going to tend to tuck pins sort of closer to the edges of greens. Even if you've got a wedge in your hand, even if you feel really good at 100 and in, we still want to be picking smart targets. You, want, you certainly want to know how far it is to you know, to the front of the green, to get over the bunker, to the back of the green. Just because we've got a wedge in our hand doesn't mean we can have like a green light license to smash it at the pin and make birdies. We still, you still can hit bad shots with a 52 or from 100 yards or whatever it is. And so you've got to be still playing just as smart as you would if you're hitting a seven. You probably are aiming slightly closer to the pin, but we're not firing at flags that cut straight over a bunker with a big steep bank left and, and whatever. I think it's especially important if there's certain hazards like a real big bunker or water near the green as well because if you do hit that shot that's not perfectly straight and you end up in there and then you end up making bogey off wedge, you're going to be more annoyed than if you'd done that with a seven iron. Yeah. So being conscious of 
what hazards are up there and which you want to avoid and putting the ball on the right side of the pin. Yeah, I think you have to, you know, not every 100 yard shot is the same, is it? You know, you every single shot, you've got to make that decision yourself. You know, if it's a deep bunker or a water hazard, you've got to get away, you know, sometimes middle of the green and leaving yourself a 20 footer is like the right shot and other times it's not, but you can't just decide when you wake up that morning, oh, the wedges feel great today. I'm just going to try and go at every flag because that's just not how golf is. Golf's really random. You know, we all have a variance. We all have a sort of shot pattern and you've got to try and, you know, just give yourself lots of good looks. You know, don't, if you've got a wedge in your hand, you've had a great shot and you've set yourself up for a low one on that hole, but don't make a mistake and ruin it because the, the tee shot's the hardest bit. We've got to still play to a safe spot, give yourself lots of chances and hopefully you knock a few in. So statistically, five foot is that distance which is kind of really valuable to your scoring because when you start missing these in terms of strokes gained, you're losing a massive chunk. So how can people work on this five foot distance and what is it most important that they do well from here? In terms of holing out, the most important skill here is club face control. We have to be starting these putts online as often as possible because as soon as that, you know, if you're more than half a degree, a degree out, you're missing the hole and you, you really have no chance. So. The drill I like to do with good players, and I, I almost get people to do this every time they play, you know, for five minutes, you know, before every round, just to sort of recalibrate yourself, is I like to do like a gate drill with two tees. So I'll point the putter, I'll put the putter on the floor, pointing at the hole behind the ball. I'll stick two tees in at the end of the grip as a bit of a gate. And then I'll stick one tee in at the end of the grip, just as somewhere to, so I know where to start from. And then, I'll just st I'll stand here for 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes, just sort of getting my eye in, making strokes, getting it through the tees. And, because if I know I'm getting it through the tees, the ball's starting online, which means my stroke's pretty good. And I can then go out and play and feel confident that I'm going to knock most of these in. And that's going to help with two things, because one, it's going to help obviously with your start line and seeing if it's straight or not. But two, I think it really focuses in your aim as well, because so much of this is where you're aiming the club face. You're not going to hit it at the hole if you're aim in a foot left yeah, yeah. so having that kind of target nearer to the ball is kind of really like narrowing in where you need to aim the club first. yeah absolutely and i guess that's why people use the line on the ball to ensure that they're aiming straight not everyone does because it freaks some people out doesn't it but generally people are very good at returning the face back to where they were aimed it so if you're aiming right you will tend to obviously hit it right doing this t drill will just highlight to you if you have any issues in your stroke, if you're pushing it and you're pulling it, and then you can, every time you play, just reset yourself. So 10 in a row, right now I'm hitting it straight and I can just go play and not worry about it from there. And presumably it'd be a really good idea to set this up on kind of break inputs as well. Yeah. Because it's gonna just make you more comfortable when you get out the course knowing, well, I know I can do these right to left and left to right because I've done it. I know my start line's good and I know it's breaking into the hole. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to almost try and imagine every putt as a straight putt. You know, we're trying to hit the ball online every time. You can do this on all, you know, do it all around the, all around the hole and sort of figure out what your tendencies are. Um, do you aim straight and try and pull it online or do you aim left and, and do something else? So. Definitely, I think it's worth moving around the hole on a slope and just getting used to, you know, starting the ball online because when you stood on a slope, it can often put you off starting it online. So it's good to practice that if you can.